All right, welcome back all of my very loyal AP Calc A, B, and BC students. Today we're going to be moving on to Unit 2. Now, hopefully you've been doing all of your Khan Academy practice that I recommended you from last video, so that you're really down-packed with uh, what we covered back with our last video on limits when we covered the difference quotient. Okay? And the difference quotient was uh, effectively... It had two forms. We got f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. And we had f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Okay? Now, I told you in the previous video that these were derived from the slope formula. You know, change in y over change in x. Change in y over change in x is the same as y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is the same as f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1, which you can see very closely paralleled here with just replacing x1 with a. But why don't I show you graphically exactly what's going on here, okay? So let's, let's draw a graph. Let's draw it with a parabola on it. Okay? Now, in your pre-calc class, you learned how to find the slope of a straight line, okay? Straight line, line y equals x. It's through the origin. And you use the formula change in y over change in x to find slope. You would pick any points on the graph. You'd say this point and this point. Let's say this is uh, x equals negative 1 and this is x equals 1. And you would find that the slope for this line is 1. Pretty simple, right? This is just review up until this point. But what you didn't cover in pre-calc, this is uniquely a calculus topic, is how to find the slope of a parabola at a distinct point, okay? Now let me clear up what I mean by that. Let me reference another topic that you covered in pre-calc, something called the average, average, a, average rate of change, abbreviated as such. Average rate of change, okay? And the average rate of change is you find two points on a graph and you draw a straight line between them. So the average rate of change between x equals 0 here and let's call this x equals 2 up here is 1. For every step we went to the right, for the two steps we went to the right, we went up two steps. But you'll notice that this is an average rate of change over an interval, okay? It only applies to an interval. But what if I don't want the average rate of change over an interval? What if I want the rate of change at a point? A tangent line, or sometimes called a line tangent to the graph, is a line that touches the graph only once. A tangent line would be tangent to a point, okay? It would only cross the graph at a single point, and ideally not touch the graph anywhere else, okay? But don't rely solely on this definition, because if I draw another graph of a function that looks like this, and I drew a line tangent to this point, something that only grazes the graph once at this point, you'd see that it intersects again right here. Okay? That would mean that this line is tangent to the graph at this point, but by chance, by accident, it also represents the average rate of change between this point and this point, okay? So this is a tangent line if you look at it just from the perspective of this one point, 
and it's a secant line if you look at it with reference to both these points, okay? But that doesn't change the fact that it still behaves as a tangent line right here. All right, and if we follow the tangent line throughout its course of the graph, you can see that at this point, the line tangent is as such. At this point, the line tangent is as such. At the vertex of the parabola, the tangent line is flat, parallel to the x-axis. At this point, you'll see the tangent line starts to uh, increase again, and so on and so forth. Now, what I'm trying to demonstrate for you here is that the tangent line represents the slope of this parabola at a singular point, okay, because the parabola is a curve. It can't have one slope because the slope is constantly changing. But even if the slope is constantly changing, it has to have a single slope at a single point. It can't have multiple slopes at a single point, okay? So that is what the difference quotient aims to achieve. If we draw a parabola and we want to find the slope of the tangent line at this point, the vertex, we, are go we could say Okay, let's start drawing points. Let's start drawing this point right here. If we draw a line between these two points, that's a secant line. That's an average rate of change, okay? But if we choose another point that is closer to the vertex, and we draw a secant line there, we will start to see that as we select points that are closer and closer, to our desired point, closer to our vertex, in this case it's the vertex, as the second point approaches the vertex, the slope of the secant line approaches the slope of the tangent line, okay? And it approaches the slope of the tangent line to the point where when the distance between these two points, when that distance is zero, which is a fancy way of saying when these two points are the same point, the secant line becomes the tangent line. All right. So you'll see as they get closer and closer, secant line starts like this, then it goes like that, then it goes like that, until it's finally flat, which is the, what the slope of the tangent line should be. It should be a flat line because if we just graze the bottom of the parabola just once at the vertex, it's gonna be a flat line. That was the purpose of what I showed you guys last time, where we had the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a, okay? The limit as one point approaches the other point of the change in y over the change in x. We're finding the average rate of change of two points that are getting infinitely closer together to the point where they are the same point, okay? Now, that obviously would run into some mathematical problems, you know? How do you find the average rate of Point, a change of two points that are the same point, which is why if you ever do the difference quotient, you will always get a zero over zero in determinant form. You will always therefore need to use the replacement theorem because the tangent line exists. You know for a fact that the tangent line exists. You know for a fact that there has to be a, a line that grazes the graph only once at that desired point. So you know it exists. We need to get rid of that zero over zero in determinant form to find it, which is where we use the replacement theorem, which we learned last class, last video. But what exactly does this mean? You know x is one point and you know a is another point. 
okay, such that x f of x and a f of a are two distinct points on the graph. Oh, this has got delta x's. It's got more than one term in the parentheses. What exactly does all that mean? Here's what it means. Okay. Delta x, you know, we saw a similar symbol up here in our slope formula. Delta x just means the change in the two x values. Two x values. Or it could be looked upon as the distance between the two x values. If I draw this graph again, and I've got a point here and a point here. Let's say this is at the point x, comma, f of x, and this top point is at a, comma, f of a. You'll notice that x minus a is the change in the x value between the two points, the change in the x value. Therefore, x minus a can be rewritten as the change in x. That's what the change in x means, okay? So given that delta x represents the change in two x values, if I would give you, um, let's say, f of 1 plus 2, you'd immediately convert that into f of 3, right? But if I gave you f of x plus delta x, what that means is this is f of our x value plus the distance between the two x values, okay? So an x value plus the distance between the two x values equals the second x value, okay? If I give you a number line here, okay, and I give you this is x and this is a, and the distance between them is delta x, if I told you x plus delta x, this value plus the distance between these two values, you'd see that that equals a, right? It makes sense now. Now that sounds a lot more complicated. I understand if you'd be tempting to use this X and A version right now, but let me explain to you why this is in fact the much easier version to use, okay? Oftentimes, you will not be given an A. And if you're not given an A, then you can't use this formula. This difference quotient is the be all end all. This will always work, okay? Because here you have no a value. You don't need to be given an a value in order to use this difference quotient. So like, I, uh, the, like the example I used in the previous video, let's say f of x equals x squared. All you need do to use this guy is say, okay, f, f of x plus delta x is x plus delta x squared minus x squared, that's a plus sign, minus x squared over delta x. And then, once we solved that out, once we got our indeterminate form, once we used our replacement theorem, once we manipulated the limit, we would get 2x. Okay, the limit as delta x approaches zero equals 2x. Okay. Now what this allows you to do is you'll notice it gave you a function. It didn't give you a finite number. It gave you a function, a function of x. What that allows you to do is since you didn't plug an a into your difference quotient, it gives you the ability to plug in your a later if you need to, if you need to, because oftentimes you won't need to. That's why I like this better, because it's sort of a one-scope-fits-all. And if, it, uh, if the problem asks you to uh, evaluate the difference quotient at 
x equals 2 and x equals 4, either you'd need to do this twice, or you'd need to do this once, and then just plug in x equals 2 and x equals 4 into that, and you'd get your two answers, okay? A little bit of clarity that I may not have mentioned before is that in this form, this form down here, x remains as x, okay? You don't plug anything in for x. a represents a constant. a represents a real number. a represents a number that you have to be given. Okay? So, in the question I just mentioned, where the question would, for example, say, evaluate the difference quotient at x equals 2 and the x equals 4, 2 and 4, first you would plug in 2 for a, and then you would solve this difference quotient, then you would plug in 4 for a and solve this difference quotient. This is not the average rate of change between 2 and 4, in which you would plug in both numbers. This is the instantaneous rate of change, which is a word that we are going to need to know, the instantaneous rate of change at a point, because it happens at an instant, okay? It happens only once. That's what I was alluding to when we had a tangent line that gra grazes the graph only once. It happens at an instant, only once. So this, the top uh, form of the difference quotient, gives you the slope at a point. The bottom version gives you a function that you can use to find the slope at a point. This function is called the derivative. Okay? A derivative is a function which represents the slope of its parent function at a particular point. At a particular point. Evaluate the difference quotient, or, in other words, find the instantaneous rate of change of x squared at x equals 2 and x equals 4. Now all you'd need to do is you would take the derivative, which in this case is 2x, and you would plug in x equals 2, x equals 2, that becomes 4, that becomes your slope at x equals 2, and you would plug in 4. 2x at x equals 4 equals 8, and that would be your slope at x equals 4, okay? The derivative gives you a function that represents the slope of your original graph at any point. Uh, again, I hope you check out Khan Academy, because that's where you'll be getting all your practice. Calculus, from my experience, I studied the, I've self-studied the vast majority of this class. It is not something you can learn by watching me do this. Once you watch me do this, you need to go to Khan Academy, and you need to do all the practice problems that you can until you get perfect scores on all of them. All right? Calculus is not a course you can just watch and learn. It is a course you need to practice and learn. Okay, we covered the two difference quotients. One that gives you the slope of the tangent line at a point, and one that gives you a function you can use to find the slope of the tangent line at a point. Okay. So, all of that is well and good if the function can have a tangent line, okay? And that is a word we call differentiability. You can find the slope of the tangent line to a function if and only if the function is differentiable. All right.
So let's say, let's take a function that's discontinuous, for example. Okay. Open circle, close circle, function like that. Okay. If we've got a discontinuity somewhere, then like there's there's no tangent line that can embody a slope there because there is no set slope there. Sure, I can draw a line that touches the graph only once, like that, but it would also touch the graph only once if I drew it like that, and like that, and like that, and you get the idea. Okay, it's not differentiable there because there's an infinite number of different tangent lines we could draw to that point. None of which are valid, none of which actually embody the slope at that point. So we can say it's uh, not differentiable if it's discontinuous. And there's another, two other actually, properties of a function that is discontinuous. The second is that we have a corner. Now let me explain to you what corner means. Let me draw another function. Here we're going to look at the absolute value of x. All right. So we've got a straight line in this section. We've got a straight line in this section. Those are both differentiable. We can find the slope there. Okay. We can find a tangent line that grazes the graph at this point, and it, in this case, the tangent line is the same line as the graph. That's possible, you can have that. But here, at this point, at, the, at a point in the graph that looks like a corner, a point in the graph where you can draw a line that grazes the graph only once in multiple ways. You see? None of which are correct, you know, because a slope has to involve an instantaneous rate of change, okay? And here, the slope could be two possible slopes. It could either be this slope that approaches from the right, or it could be this slope that approaches from the left. And this is where we need to introduce one-sided limits yet again, okay? So I hope you recall from our limits videos, from the limits chapter, that if we're given a function, looks like that, we can approach a point of interest from the left or from the right. We can have a limit as x goes to a from the left, and we can have a limit as x goes to a from the right, denoted with this positive sign indicating from the right, and this negative sign indicating from the left. Okay? Now given that, we can also find the limit as delta x approaches 0 from the left of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. We can find the slope of the tangent line as it approaches from the left, and we can find the slope of the tangent line as it approaches from the right. Okay, and if you also remember from our limits chapter, we stated that the limit exists if and only if the limit as x approaches some number a from the left equals the limit as x approaches some number a from the right, obviously of f of x. So, in this case, the slope approaches one number from the left and a completely different number from the right. Therefore, the limit does not exist. D N E. And if the limit of the difference quotient does not exist, that means the derivative 
does not exist. Therefore, the function is non-differentiable at that point. It's differentiable everywhere else, just not at that point. Okay, so a corner is meant to signify that a function is approaching two different slopes from the left and from the right. Okay, now a corner does not need to be a 90 degree angle. Okay, a corner is just meant to signify that there is a hard break in the shape of the graph. It's no longer continuous and curvy and smooth. It has a jagged edge. That's a corner. That's a corner right there. Okay. Now there's a special kind of corner known as a cusp. Okay. And a, a cusp is a special kind of corner uh, because it involves a graph that looks like this. Where that looks like a corner, which is why it's classified as a type of corner, but if we look at the limit from the left, limit as x goes to a of f of x, from the left, we can see, let me, uh, excuse me, difference quotient, f of x minus f of a over x minus a, we see that from the left, it approaches negative infinity, and from the right, in the right, it approaches positive infinity. Okay. Now, so what? Big whoop. They approach two different values, the same way how we saw with the corner. Why is this so different? Well, that's because... Let's write the full thing out again, just for ease of teaching. x minus a from the left of x f of x minus f of a over x minus a equals negative infinity, and the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x minus f of a over x minus a equals positive infinity. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm about to tell you. We said in the first video that a limit exists when it equals a finite number. Therefore, if your limit equals infinity, it does not exist. Okay? We know what causes it to not exist because it diverges to infinity, but a limit that equals infinity technically does not exist. Infinity is just a more specific way of saying it does not exist. All limits that diverge to negative or positive infinity don't exist. But not all limits that don't exist diverge to negative or positive infinity. It's a more specific subsection of does not exist. Okay? With that new knowledge, we can now say that not only does the limit not exist, but the one-sided limits also don't exist. That's why a cusp is a special type of corner. Okay, and the third way of a function being non-differentiable is with a vertical tangent line. Okay, vertical tangent line uh, looks a little something like this. We got a function that goes bump. And here we've got a vertical tangent line at exactly this point, at x equals zero. Now, for reasons I've just discussed, the limit as x goes to a of the difference quotient can be found, you know, with limit as x goes to a from the left, which in this case it equals the limit as x goes to a from the right, because they both equal positive infinity. So the one-sided limits equal each other, but remember, infinity is just a fancy does not exist. Therefore, even though we can draw a tangent line to this, we're still not differentiable here because the difference quotient does not exist. It goes to infinity, which is a type of does not exist.
if you're ever, so, you know, this uh, vertical tangent seems pretty straightforward, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm confident that a lot of you would be able to identify where a slope is vertical. I'm confident that you guys would be able to identify where we've got a discontinuity. But it's these cusps and corners that tend to uh, trip people up. Maybe their eyes miss it. Maybe they have some optical illusion where they think it really is smooth and curvy. So what I want you guys to do is I'm going to draw a picture here, but I think uh, it's most effectively seen if you pull up Desmos right now and plug in something like this. If we were to take the function f of x equals x squared, we were to draw that out. No? The way we can tell this is differentiable is because if we zoom in to the graph, if we zoom in like an infinite amount, I, this is just really zoomed in to the bottom here. And if we keep zooming in, it's like, we will eventually converge to a flat line, okay? If you're infinitely zoomed in, that means you're zoomed into a single point, you'll see a flat line. That's technically your tangent line. And this property of functions is a property we call local linearity. Because if you zoom in so far to the local level, the function will appear linear. All right? Cusps and corners do not appear linear if you zoom in far enough. Obviously, these don't appear linear because there's no place to zoom into. You don't know which side of the discontinuity to zoom into. This appears linear, but it appears linear because the slope is a straight up and down line. If you learned in pre-calc, what do you call a line like this? A line with zero slope. What do you call a line like this? You don't call it a line with infinite slope, you call it a line with undefined slope. Okay, now, that's pretty much all of the big picture general stuff with uh, differentiability. Just one top thing I want you guys to take away from this is based off of our first product here, first of all, first characteristic, it's not differentiable if it's not continuous. The contrapositive of that statement is also valid. It is definitely, I don't know how to spell, it is definitely continuous if the function is differentiable, okay? If it is, if a function is differentiable, it is guaranteed to be continuous not the other way around. You see here, absolute value of x is continuous, but it's not differentiable. Okay? Now, let me just throw you back a little bit to a topic that we covered in our limits video, the IVT, the Intermediate Value Theorem. Okay, the Intermediate Value Theorem, quick review, stated that if you've got a point here and a point here, both of which exist on the graph of a function, that means that that function has to achieve every y value between those two points at least once. Okay? If you want a better explanation, go watch the limits video. I think it's the last limits video. That property, the IVT, Intermediate Value Theorem, also applies to derivatives. Okay? If you remember from our uh, first intro to the derivative video. When we solved uh, one of the difference quotients, we got a function. When we solved limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x, 
minus f of x over delta x, and we evaluate it when f of x equals x squared, we found that this evaluates to 2x, which is a function. Okay, we can graph that function. Graph of the function 2x. The intermediate value theorem still applies because this is a function. If you recall, the requirements to use the intermediate value theorem was that the function had to be continuous. And 2x, we all know, is continuous. So we can say that the derivative of x squared, which is denoted by the following notation, f prime of x equals 2x, this f prime is what we use to designate the derivative of a function, the derivative of f of x in this case. You could write g prime of x, you could write y prime of x, if you wrote it as y equals x squared, you could write y prime equals 2x. Now we can say if there are two points on the graph of f prime of x, you know, f prime of x equals a and b at two different points, then we can say that f prime of x has to achieve every point between those two points. All right, that's your introduction to the derivative. Remember to practice on Khan Academy, guys. You owe it to yourselves. You will not retain any of this information unless you practice. I urge you to do that. As we continue evaluating more and more difference quotients, we start to notice patterns, okay? And those patterns become our derivative rules. All right. They can be proven. These derivative rules are rules that are universal. Since the proofs for these rules are not on the AP exam, we don't care about them. Anyway, so there, first of all, let's come up with a simple, the first one. Let's say we are given a function f of x equals 4. All right. Same as y equals 4. If you draw it out, it's a straight line. It's a straight line, okay? So if you do one of the difference quotients with that, if you do uh, f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x, you get a zero over zero in determinant form, okay? But you can see here that the slope is always going to be zero because, excuse me, because this line is always flat. It's a flat line. The slope is always zero, okay? So therefore, if you take the derivative of a number, a constant number, that's always going to equal zero. By the way, this is a notation that you're going to have to be familiar with. This d dx that I drew out here, this is an operator. It's like a plus sign, it's like a division sign, a multiplication sign. Those are all operators. Okay? The division sign is an operator that tells you to divide two things. This d dx is an operator that tells you take the derivative of whatever's in the square brackets. Okay? I, I would advise that you use square brackets uh, whenever possible. Get into the habit of doing that because it's going to make uh, both your life and the life of your grader a lot easier. And the last thing you want to do is to make your grader start hating you. This is just a clear form of specifying exactly what you're taking the derivative of, putting it in square brackets. Anyway, I'm sure that's pretty self-explanatory. We know that a flat line, the, the slope of that line, the derivative of that line will always be flat, zero. Okay? Moving on to a higher order function. Let's take the function y equals x. y equals x. Straight, straight line. Still a straight line. Okay? For that matter, y equals 2x. y equals 3x. They're all straight lines with different slopes. But they're all straight lines, mind you. Okay? So let's come back to our difference quotient. We're going to take the limit 
as delta x approaches zero of, let's say, f of x equals 2x. Let's say that's our function. We would say uh, 2x plus 2 delta x minus 2x over delta x. Limit as delta x goes to zero, again, indeterminate form. But as we reevaluate this, we can see limit as delta x goes to zero of 2 delta x over delta x, because these 2x two, two and minus 2x on either side cancel out. And then we use the replacement theorem on this, limit as delta x goes to zero of 2, by the replacement theorem. then we can see there's no delta x term in this limit. Therefore, this equals 2. If I can't plug it in, then nothing happens to it. Therefore, the derivative of any first degree function, the derivative of any function that contains an x and only an x, no x squareds, no rad x's, x to the first power, d dx of a x, the uh, letter a here is used to represent any constant number, any constants, constants 1, negative 1, 400, those are all constants. The derivative of a x always equals a, okay? Take notes of all the derivative rules I'm writing out for you, because you will need to know all of them, you will need to practice all of them on Khan Academy, you will need to commit all of them to second nature. Okay. Moving on, we've got higher order functions, okay? Those are functions like x squared, x to the third, x to the fourth, etc., etc. So, if we do difference quotient on those, limit as delta x approaches zero of x plus delta x squared minus x squared over delta x. Now you've done these difference quotients, you've practiced all of them, I'm sure you followed my advice when I told you to go to Khan Academy and practice all your difference quotients. Anyway, body yada yada, you should get an answer of 2x. And that's when you perform the difference quotient on x squared. When you perform it on x to the third, you should get 3x squared. When you do it on x to the fourth, you should get 4x to the third. The pattern here is once you take the derivative of any function x to the a, x to any constant number, it will always become a multiplied by x to the a minus 1 power, okay? Looks a bit complex now, but let's reason our way through it, all right? This was originally x to the third. We took the third and we brought it down here, okay? It came from in the x, it came from the exponent position down in front of the uh, x as a multiple. Then what we did to the exponent is we decremented it by 1. We subtracted 1 from it. So x to the third became x squared multiplied by 3. All right? That's your next rule that you need to memorize. Another rule that is not necessarily a derivative rule but is more important about manipulating it, which you're going to need to be proficient in, is if I gave you f of x equals 4x squared, for example, okay? And I asked you to find f prime of x. Again, f prime of x is just the derivative. f prime of x is just the solution to the delta x difference quotient, okay? What you would be able to do there is you could take the difference quotient, you could take the derivative of the x squared multiplied by 4. Now let me write that out for you guys so it's easier to understand. 
d dx, the derivative of a x to the n, okay, n here is again used to represent any real number, any constant number, but a and n don't have to be the same, okay? So a could equal 4 in this case, and n could equal 2 in this case. Any number a or n, all right? The derivative of any function that looks like this equals d dx, you know, x to the n multiplied by a, all right? What we did there is we took a out of the derivative operator. Right, let me let me rewrite that. Future Meek, cut that part out. The derivative of any function ax to the n equals a times the derivative x to the n. Okay? What I did here is I just took the constant multiple of the x to the n term and I brought it outside of the derivative operator. All right? You are only, pay attention to my words here, you are only able to do this with a constant multiple, a constant a. If, for example, I asked you to take the derivative of x times x to the n, you would not, you would not be able to say that is the same as the derivative x d dx x to the n. Okay? This in fact, would equal d dx x to the n plus 1, okay? Because when we multiply two like bases together, flash back to your pre-calc knowledge, when we multiply two like bases together, we add their exponents. Any uh, function x has an invisible exponent of 1. So when adding these exponents to combine the bases, we get an x to the n plus 1, where this constant exponent has been increased by 1. Okay? So we have a, the ability to manipulate the constant multiple of a function by bringing it outside the derivative operator. Okay. So next, we need to deal with what do you do if you have something that looks like this? Okay? The easy way to do it is to combine it, like I performed for you, but sometimes that's not really possible. Like, for example, if I gave you the, uh, hmm, what's a function that I could use? Let's say I gave you f of x equals the natural log of x times x squared, okay? But you can't combine natural log of x and x squared into the same term. Therefore, we need a derivative rule that can help us with multiplication. And that would be the product rule. So, take a look at this function. The product rule applies to any function f of x let me, let me use a different, it applies to any function h of x in which h of x can be represented as a function times another function. The product rule can be applied to any function that can be represented as two functions multiplied by one another, okay? And the way we find h prime of x, the way we find the derivative of such a function is with the following formula. f prime x times g of x plus g prime x times f of x. That is the formula for the product rule. Therefore, the derivative of h of x up here, h prime x equals this. All right, so let me use this example just for us to clarify it. Let's pretend we forgot how to combine like bases and we had to do the product rule. 
f of x equals x squared times x. Okay? First, you need to decide what's your first function and what's your second function. All right? Your first function, you know, you decide. Okay? Multiplication is commutative. You can manipulate it how you want. And the formula tells us to take the derivative of the first function, so the derivative of x squared, according to this formula, is 2x times the second function, plus the derivative of the second function, which we evaluated to be 1, because there is a secret invisible 1 in front of the x, times the first function, f of x, x squared. Which, so f prime x equals this, which equals 2x squared plus x squared, which equals 3x squared. Okay? And you're able to see that our original functions equals x to the third, and if we do this rule, also known as the power rule, on this guy, we get this guy. This is what we do when we find two functions multiplied together. Now that obviously begets the question, what do we do when we have two functions divided by one another? And that brings us to the quotient rule. Now to be clear, you don't need to memorize the names of any of these rules. Okay, you just need to know how to use them. Quotient rule. It applies, it operates on the same basic premise as the product rule. There's a formula which you need to memorize. And let's say we're given the function h of x equals some function f of x over some function g of x. The way we would find h prime of x, the way we would find h prime of x is f prime, no, excuse me. The way we would find h prime x is g of x times f prime of x minus f of x times g prime x over g of x squared. All right. Now, this is the more challenging formula to remember because there's a minus sign. In the product rule, you could flip around the placements of the two sides of the plus sign because addition is uh, commutative. But here, the g of x times f prime of x must always be before the g prime of x times f of x. So the order matters in this one. Funny little, uh, funny little song that a lot of my calculus friends and calculus uh, teacher used to remember this is we uh, associate names where this is the top of the division bar so we call it high and this is the bottom of the division bar so we call it low alright and the little uh, rhyme goes a little something like this low d high minus high d low all over low squared. I, a lot of people learn it to different tunes. I learned it to E-I-E-I-O. Low d high minus high d low all over. That's jack in the box. I learned it to jack in the box. Low d high minus high d low all over low squared. I think it's jack in the box. Anyway. Low d high minus high d low all over low squared. It's, it's useful, trust me. Anyway, moving on. Next rule. What's the next rule? The trig functions. So we have six trig functions. Sine, cosine, tangent, and their reciprocals, cosecant, secant, cotangent. Alright, 
again, they're just rules that you need to memorize. The derivative of sine sine x equals cosine x. The derivative of cosine x equals negative sine x. All right? So you can see that you can continuously loop back and forth between cosine and sine if you take more derivatives. So if I took the derivative of this guy, derivative of negative sine x, if I put this guy in the derivative operator, I would get negative cosine x. And the cycle repeats. You put negative cosine x in the derivative operator, you would get sine x. Because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and we have a negative 1 that's a constant multiple that we can take out, and when this negative multiplies with that negative, they become a positive 1, and the derivative of negative cosine x becomes positive sine x. Okay. Again, just derivative rules you need to memorize. I made flashcards. This is the only topic in the entirety of my math education where I have needed to make flashcards for. Okay? It's brute memorization. That's all it is. Derivative of tangent of x equals secant x squared. The derivative of What's the next one? Cosecant x equals uh, negative cosecant x times cotangent x. The derivative of secant x equals secant x times tan x. And the derivative of cotan x equals negative cosecant x squared. The negative goes outside the parentheses. Negative cosecant x squared. Okay? So these are your six trig derivative rules. This is just an example I gave you. If you want a little trick, you'll notice that the derivatives of all the functions that start with a c Cosine, cosecant, and cotangent, those are the only three rules that have a negative sign. Okay, the ones that don't have a C, sine, tangent, secant, they're all positive. And that's, that's pretty much the easiest rule I can give you. Okay, moving on to the next derivative rule you need to memorize, the uh, inverse trig functions. Okay? You probably covered this for a very brief period in pre-calc, but they're effectively sine inverse, cosine inverse, tan inverse, cosecant inverse, secant inverse, and cotan inverse. Okay. Um, these are not necessarily the most useful now. You're not going to see a lot of questions on these derivatives, these will pertain to a very important unit as we go forward into antiderivatives, into integrals in unit 6, okay? But we can't cover them there because this is the derivative unit and we need to cover derivatives now. So if you're really pressed for time and you have a test on derivatives tomorrow, you can ignore what I'm about to say. But if you're trying to self-study this course and you're trying to learn it uh, by yourself or you're trying to review for the final exam, please stick around for this. Just know that these are part of the... Yeah, well, let's, let's get into it. So, another set of rules you're just going to need to memorize. d dx of sine inverse x equals... 1 over rad 1 minus x squared d dx cosine inverse x 
equals negative 1 over rad 1 minus x squared. You're going to see the same pattern here. All the, all the derivatives that have a c uh, that begins them have a negative. d dx tan x equals 1 over 1 plus x squared. d dx cosecant x equals, uh, I believe it's 1 negative 1 over absolute value x rad x squared minus 1 d dx secant x if you can't see because of my shoulder I'm gonna move over in just a moment is 1 over absolute value x rad x squared minus 1 and finally the derivative of cotan x is negative 1 over x squared plus 1. Those are your inverse trig derivatives. Those are your trig derivatives. Again, they're annoying memorization, both of them. But you gotta, you, this, you gotta commit this to second nature. Okay, we're almost done with the derivative rules, guys. Just two more types of functions and they're kind of related to one another, so that makes it slightly easier. That's the function y equals e to the x, and it's different forms like 2 to the x, 3 to the x, etc. And we've got y equals the natural log of x, and its uh, versions like log base 4 of x, log base 2 of x. Remember, the natural log is log base e of x, and e to the x is e to the x. All right? You'll see why that's important in just a moment. So the derivative of log base a of x is log base a of x. Oh no, excuse me. It's... What is it? Oh, okay. The derivative of log base a of a is 1 over x times the natural log of a, okay? So you take this, the base of the logarithm, and you put it as the operator in the natural log, what the natural log is being done to. It's not ln base a, it's ln of a, okay? Remember, the base of natural log is always e. You can't change the base of a natural log because then it's no longer a natural log. All right, therefore, the derivative of the natural log of x, remember the base here is e, is 1 over x. You know why? Because the same derivative rule still applies. We still take the base and we put it into the natural log, but ln of e is 1. So 1 times x is just 1 over x. All right, you're going to see a similar pattern with e to the x. If I take the derivative of a to the x, any number a to the x, that equals a to the x multiplied by ln a. Therefore, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x times ln e. ln e is 1. Therefore, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. This is a function where the derivative is itself, and it will always be itself. Now, a common mistake I want to point out before we move on to the next unit, uh, not next unit, next, yeah, next unit. One common mistake that I want to point out before we move on to the next unit is, um, 
So like I illustrated above, you can take the derivative multiple times, okay? So let's say we're given the function f of x equals e to the x. We know by this rule that f prime of x equals e to the x, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, f double prime of x, the second derivative of the first function, so we took one derivative, and then we take the derivative of this guy to get to f double prime of x, that equals e to the x. What I've seen a lot of people do is, let's say I give you f of x equals 2 to the x, all right? You would be able to use this rule I outlined right here, and you'd say f prime of x equals 2 to the x times ln 2, and that would be correct. But if you took the derivative of f prime of x to find f double prime of x, a lot of kids would say that that's a product rule problem. It's not a product rule problem, no, because ln2 is a constant. There's no x in there, that's not a function. ln2 is not a function. ln of 2 is a number, it's a constant number. Therefore, this is constant multiple rule, which we saw right here. The derivative, the second derivative would be 2 to the x times ln2 times ln2. Ellen, too, yeah. Okay.